Pleiadian humans, came here as warrior colonists about 3,500 years ago. There were 50,000, and they were from seven different human planets. They landed in the region we call Europe and we think of them as European Whites. They evolved as different people with different European languages on seven different worlds, none of them from Earth. This is where the German, French, Italian, Spanish, Polish, Hungarian and Slav languages came from. All other European languages, including English, have evolved here. They came here to Earth because they and their planets were at war with an invading race called the Reptilians. The Reptilians had invaded two human worlds and exterminated the humans there. This was a war of no quarter. The warrior colonists, Pleiadian space forces had thoroughly destroyed four large reptilian hives and numerous subhives here on Earth. They made sure nothing survived. Their warrior colonists were landed to complete any additional destruction of reptilian forces here and to hold the planet if the reptilians reinvaded. Unbeknownst to the Pleiadian space forces, the reptilians had a fifth major hive under the ice in Antarctica which was not detected and not destroyed. The reptilians sent diplomatic signals and a truce was established for planet Earth only. You ask why a truce would apply. Most of the population of humans on Earth were slave races created by the reptilian allies who called themselves the Anunnaki. The Pleiadian space forces did not know that a reptilian hive still survived and agreed to a truce for Earth only. The warrior colonists were landed and appeared to thriving. The slave races created by the Anunnaki were a mix of Anunnaki reptilian DNA genetically engineered into various indigenous primate from all over planet Earth. The Anunnaki came to Earth originally to mine gold and diamonds, but only came with about 400 males. They needed slave labor preformed the mining and desired to have women as sexual companions. Many of the primates used to create Homo sapiens did not survive the process and became extinct. This is what happened to the Neanderthals from what we call Europe. It also explains why there was no indigenous population to contest the landings of the Pleiadian warrior colonists. Unfortunately for the Earth, the conditions of the truce were to sever all communications between the Pleiadian space forces and the warrior colonists. They were left to fend for themselves and soon turned to fighting amongst themselves and, eventually, 
conquering the known world. Shi Oshima, the former Japanese ambassador to Germany during World War II, believed that the noble caste in Japan, the daimo and the samurai, were descended from gods of celestial origin. We call that the European colonization. The Pleiadian space forces did not know what to do with the millions, now billions, of slave populations created by the Anunnaki reptilians and decided to collect data and study the problem before taking any action. Meanwhile, the reptilian hidden hive began expanding itself into the five original hive locations again. Alsace-Lorraine in Europe Near Perth in Australia South of the Pyramids in Egypt In New Mexico, USA And Antarctica Ok. There is a huge problem here. When the Anunnaki and reptilians created these slave races, they included a kind of telepathy that is unique to the reptilian hive system, we call this mind control today. So, as the reptilian hive expanded into all five hives again, the reptilians were able to use mind control on the slave races with greater and greater success. This was something the Pleiadian space forces were unaware about until recently, since the year 2000. There have been dramatic developments in the wars between Pleiadian humans and the reptilians and Nunaki Grey allies. Without going into detail, the Pleiadian humans defeated the reptilians in several large space engagements and learned how to defeat all reptilians forces here on Earth in a stealthy way, they jammed the Hive Queens. In September of 1991, the space shuttle Discovery captured an unidentified object on film. What you're seeing now is actual footage shot by NASA cameras from that shuttle mission. Watch the top of your screen. Note the object that moves from right to left. Two mysterious flashes, and it makes an immediate 135 degree turn, and accelerates. This is followed by a strange streak of light, which seems to narrowly miss the unknown object. This dramatic footage has been in dispute since it was shot. I studied it extensively over maybe two-year period at least. University of Nebraska physicist Jack Kasher worked for nearly 10 years in the research and development of a Star Wars defense system for the upper atmosphere. His quantitative analysis of the NASA footage concludes that the UFO cannot be explained as a natural phenomenon. It's clearly above the atmosphere and airglow of the Earth. It maneuvers, it changes direction, it accelerates, and so the only thing really left is spacecraft. Now, we are finally free of the reptilian mind control or at least the reptilian part of it. I am going to digress a bit, think of the many wars that have been fought on Earth over the last 300 years. There was the first worldwide war between France, Holland, Spain and England which included the American Revolution, lots of fighting in the Caribbean and India. Then there was the Napoleonic Wars, the American Civil War, the War of 1870, the Spanish-American War, WW1 and WW2. The odd thing is that most of the fighting and blood spilled came from Europeans or European colonists. The reason for this is that the reptilians did not have a mind control capability over the Pleiadian human warrior colonists and engineered ways to kill off as many of them as possible in wars and diseases. Over the past 100 years, or so, Europe and much of world has experienced a collectivist philosophy and system of governance called socialism or communism or fascism which was almost responsible to another bloodbath, but WW3 did not happen. We told you 
about a possible missile, rocket, or maybe airplane that was seen off the coast of California on Monday? Today, there still aren't many answers as to what it actually was, but one woman says she has some answers. You'd be surprised to find out where she's getting her information from. Colleen Thomas is a home health administrator turned physicist who specializes in the science of creation. And she's the mother of a race of good aliens here on Earth called Pleiadians. She says she knows exactly what happened with that missile. And she joins me now from Roseville, California. Colleen, thanks so much for joining me. First of all, tell me what you know about what happened with that supposed missile. Uh, it was a, uh, I got in my ear as it were, uh, as I was sleeping, that it was a missile fire, uh, President Obama trying to, uh, to start a war with Iran. Uh, the Pleiadians downed the missile uh, harmlessly at sea, and then uh, last night from San Diego, our government fired another ICBM at the Pleiadians this time. But the Pleiadian ships are able to uh, change density and do all kinds of things that these guys on, on this planet have never imagined. And a rocket could pass right through them and not harm them. And plus, they can outrun it, too, if they, if they wanted to just get out of the way. But um, it, it's, it's really kind of silly to think that we can take on a race that's been around for many, many, many millions of eons longer than the reptilians. And really briefly, Colleen, um, some people might not know exactly who the Pleiadians were, so why would President Obama want to fire an ICBM at the Pleiadians? Because they're here to rescue the human beings who are being enslaved on this planet and forced into a, a paradigm of a, of, a, of a super oligarchy that favors the Bilderberg Group and the Illuminati and is completely and utterly without any conscience towards the human beings whatsoever. They poison us deliberately in order for us to have to buy pharmaceuticals so that they can string our miserable little lives along on pharmaceuticals for the rest of our uh, uh, you know, aging days. There's no need for us to be in the kind of physical condition that we are in. But they put chemtrails uh, in collusion with BP, British Petroleum, they put chemicals in jet fuel, and, and that jet, those chemicals end up getting sprayed in these uh, minute particulates that rain down on our food, on our crops, and in our water. There's lithium in, the, in the, those chemtrails. There's also uh, fluoride and uh, a lot of other heavy metals uh, that are dispersed in the air as chaff so that the American government can, can talk to one another militarily without being listened in upon by other foreign countries. They know this stuff is toxic for us, but, but there's money in, 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 in toxifying us. And so they kind of, they work in collusion with the pharmaceutical companies with these backdoor deals, changing the laws and making everything every, you know, favorable for these guys, but not favorable for the humans whatsoever. Humans are just commerce to these people, and they're also meat to these people. They, they not only kill and, and eat us, they sell our dead bodies on a, on a meat market of their own kind that goes passing by here every 50 years. And I got that straight from a CIA agent. This is a direct result of reptilian mind control over our leaders in the Western world. Yep, the reptilians started kidnapping people and putting DNA implants in them. This allowed the reptilians to exercise nearly total mind control over both the slave race and Pleiadian human leaders. Anyone who was implanted this way was instructed to go into politics, government and finances. Unfortunately, most of our political leaders, everywhere on earth, are implants who have been doing the work of the hive, big government, big labor and the destruction of freedom. In 2000, when the Pleiadian Space Forces found out about the extent of the mind control in the slave races, they started landing Pleiadian human men and women here to collect genetic information on the people of Earth. They are amongst us now and look exactly like anyone who is of white European heritage. Their major issue is they cannot allow any reptilian DNA primate hybrids to leave Earth because of the susceptibility to reptilian mind control. It turns out that the reptilians had a plan to infiltrate Earth humans onto other human planets to assist in the invasion and conquering. Many of us are awaiting the arrival of extraterrestrials, many of us are them, they are here amongst us now. 
and have been protecting us for thousands of years. We live in interesting times. Thing is, uh, the lizards. Okay, lizards been around a long time, like since before ancient Egypt and everything. And the uh, the symbol, you know, that eye, the eye of Horus with the squiggly hanging out of it, yeah. that has to do with lizards. It has. It's a lizard symbol. It means two things. It's a pro lizard symbol, and it also means beware. There's lizards here. Okay. There's three different kinds of lizards. I'll tell you all about them. They're called vril. The thing is, I'm not sure if it's one L or two at the end. It's vril. V r i l l or v r i l. Uh, Germans were into them. They had a club with vril things. Anyway, there's a there's like a one to one and a half foot tall one. That's the vril type one. Um, it's got scales, red scales. Uh, there's a type two that that is not parasitic, but it's still vicious, nasty, carnivorous. They're all carnivorous. And there's a type three that's eight feet tall that uh, has a real long neck and looks like a gray, gray alien. But it comes from deep, deep, deep underground. Like, like I mean, like be below deep base deep. Like uh, they need a a methane oxygen mix to breathe and deep underground they got sulfur pools I guess that make this stuff anyway they come up underneath the dumb's bases the the government is complicit with them basically now now I have to tell you about the parasitic aspect of the lizards and why the Illuminati and the governments use them okay I'm saying this in a nutshell because it's very important I want to get it all out on your show uh, nobody's going to say this for fear of clone torture, remote controlled death, or death by lizards a thousand times until you die by a heart attack or something. Um, but I figure I, I have to tell people because, well, they're getting me there anyway. Like, uh, they eased up lately asking me not to talk about it anymore, but uh, I'm just going to. Uh, well, the lizards have a thing, okay? They have what's called a proboscis. There's lizards out there today that have a proboscis on their face, okay? These things got it in the middle of their head, okay? And on the top of their head, this is the real type 1 and 2, one and two. The, the type 2 have a proboscis sheath that comes out, it sticks out. Um, the type 1s, for instance, it's like a micro, or, uh, a chocolate chip, it looks like, basically the tip of it. Now, one point in these things' lives, because they have a long lifespan, lizard species, one point in their life, uh, they can slowly wiggle this thing out, eject it, and it goes into somebody's eyeball, okay, another animal. Now, it wiggles in by the sense of taste. They described this to me so, like, when I was like 18 years old there, and told me about it different times throughout the years of going there. They, they can bring you there every single night if they want to, and they did bring me there every night. They laughed at me when I said I was going to tell the world about this. They said, nobody's ever going to believe me. You won't put it together in a eloquent way. People will think that technology isn't that uh, advanced yet with cloning because they just clone the sheep, right? No. Um, they've been cloning people a long time this way. Uh, thing is, the lizard, okay, the thing squiggles in through the eye. It uh, does a spiral around the optic nerve all the way to a certain point and it's driven there by taste and they they said once it gets there it has the taste of uh, butterscotch and then it does a feeling like uh, holding your breath and going pushing outwards and at the tip of this chocolate chip it then starts what if they call sweating the quill now the the spinal cord stuff comes out of the spinal cord out of the chocolate chip thingy and it's everything that the lizard is the lizard's whole body is dead that little lizard thing is dead uh, and it can't go back in can't get it back in it's one way uh, once it sh excretes this stuff sweats this quill thing um, the person's debilitated for an unknown amount of time I don't know how long but when they come back they have to have some recovery time but when they come back they are not the person anymore they are then the lizard let me put this to you flatly the, the old person's consciousness is gone. The body is absolutely, totally dominated, and the lizard is smarter as a human then and totally controls everything. Over time, it'll develop a rash. It'll, it'll lose its hair. Um, thing is, these things are all over the place, and they mimic human behavior. In, in fact, one of their names in the past is Mimic. 
a lot of the people that you hear about in the news that are getting people and chopping them up in the basement and eating them and stuff, frying them up, these are what they call drones. They're parasited hosts of the lizards. They like to make them. Um, the only thing a drone wants to do is make more, have sex, and torture someone. Like, uh, it's, it's a different kind of mentality. It's hard to explain. Um, when they, when they, at the cloning station, when they victimize someone, uh, it gives them a, a powerful feeling, and it's the nerdy way, you know, that, that nerdy aspect of it, uh, oh, I got something over someone, uh, but they do that to the extreme. Oh, and alien abductions. Let me tell you something. They videotape alien, alien abductions. They set up alien abductions with Hollywood makeup and stuff. Like, not all of them. I can't say all of them. Some of them might be real, for all I know. But I've seen the set. It's a really crappy-looking saucer. You just walk up a ramp into it. They never see the outside of it. But uh, they clone people, right, and then activate them when they're on the slab strapped down. Now, someone goes in with a, a, a gray mask, with, and the mask is made of chicken skin, okay? Just to give it that aspect of realism, um, dyed gray chicken skin so it'll look real and does it look real stretched over a mask right and they have the mask on they go in at the lizard thing the, they just totally take them over um they they do it a lot it used to be it's a luciferian thing um they said that these lizards were the sons of satan or whatever lucifer or whatever um they're not though they're just a, a species of lizard that survived the extinction of the dinosaurs by being way way underground um, I'll just tell you, I know it sounds retarded, the damn things can talk, okay, uh, but they don't have a tongue. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about their mouths, it takes a while. Basically, they have a blood spike, okay, uh, this is what they call a chupacabra, too. They come up from underground different spots all over the world, right, like uh, worms out of a rotten apple, different spots, and then they infiltrate the society there. But uh, the drones today have erased, well, of 100 years ago, erased any existence of these real lizards from, like, uh, Egyptian carvings on walls, they would smash them, right? Or books that had anything in them about them, they would burn them. Because um, drones don't want to get found out and sent off and killed. Like, um, this is what I thought FEMA camps were for, rounding up drones, because they've been talking about it at the cloning center. This is where they discuss all political, worldly affairs, and they let me sit in fly on the wall because they figure nobody's going to ever believe me that they can clone anybody in everybody that, uh, there is bored of it the whole technology it lost the novelty like 10 years ago right so they go there and they talk to brad pitt and uh let me tell you all the celebrities because they bring them there and they tell them look you're here you're going to hang with us if you don't want to well if they cry and make a fuss like lauren hill from the fugees uh, make a song about I get out and stuff. They let her not go to the cloning station. They don't activate her, let her have normal dreams. But other people, they really grill them to stay. And uh, they say, if you ever talk about it, you're going to die. They made the, Oh, but the reason Britney Spears went pop, do you want to know their one eye? That means two things. That means watch out, you don't get the lizard to stick the thing. Well, it means a couple different things to different people. It means like, uh, don't... Um, you only half see things, and I always figured it was the lizard in the eye thing. Well, the thing with the pyramid in the eye thing is the whole symbol is a joke. It's uh, once you know what the pyramid is for, then you you know when you're pretty much Illuminati. But I'm going to break that whole thing right now. I'm going to ruin it. Um, you got to look on my page and look at the schematics for the pyramid. I explain what it's for. Um, it was basically a vril trap. It's a giant cockroach trap for vrills, okay? These little vents that went in, they were at an angle, they were lined with uh, smooth limestone, and uh, anything that went in didn't come out because these crab nasties claws, well, that's why I call them crab nasties, the vrills. I've been calling them that my whole life. Um, they couldn't scramble back up and out. Yeah. You heard about the celebrities selling their souls to the place, so that's what they're doing. They're selling themselves to be used as clones at the cloning center.
4,000 years ago, I would not have had to tell you this, since if you lived in those times you would have been taught this in school, but 4,000 years of a powerful directed misinformation campaign, have taken their toll, and it'll take me some effort here, to clarify some basics for you. The Sumerian civilization is the oldest known human civilization on earth. Their gods were called the Anunnaki, which in Sumerian means those who from heaven to earth came. It blossomed out almost overnight, around 3800 BC, in Mesopotamia, the land between the two rivers, Tigris and Euphrates, and came to a sudden end in 2024 BC, when it was laid waste by a deadly radioactive cloud, brought by easterly winds from the Sinai Peninsula, where according to some ancient records, a nuclear war took place. The huge black scar in the face of the earth, in the southeastern part of the Sinai Peninsula, and the blackened stones that show signs, of being instantly melted by extreme intense heat. There is more evidence. Higher than normal levels of radioactivity, have been found in the Dead Sea. The site of Sodom and Gomorrah have been nuked at the same time. And in the land of Sumer itself, a recent study has found that around the time of the destruction of Sumer, there was a sudden climate change there, the nature of which is consistent with a nuclear fallout. The Sumerian civilization disappeared around 2000 BC, just as suddenly as it appeared. It is clear that its fall was very tragic as many Sumerian lamentation texts have been found bewailing the destruction and desolation of various Sumerian cities. All these lamentation texts blame the destruction, on the use of some weapons of terror and some great deadly cloud. The detailed descriptions of their effects leave no doubt that the weapons of terror were nuclear weapons. The intercontinental ballistic missiles, that dropped nuclear warheads on Sodom and Gomorrah were launched from Africa and belonged to the Anunnaki. The Sumerian era epic, lists five cities, along with the spaceport in the Sinai, that were nuked, Sodom and Gomorrah being only two of them, the Bible goes into more detail, as to what was actually going on. History had it that, following the invasion of the Pleiadians, helped by Abram, the Anunnaki met in their assembly, and decided to nuke the spaceport, so that it did not fall into the hands of the Pleiadians. Armed with proper understanding, of who the ancient gods really were, we can now properly address the question, of why do we not see them and their advanced technologies among us, and why have we not seen them, over the past few centuries? Where did they go? Zechariah Sitchin does not answer, or even address this question, and for the most part ends his Earth Chronicles in 2024 BC. In my research, I have found that all evidence points to the Anunnaki gods, being overpowered and forced off the Earth, by Yahweh of Judeo-Christianity, over the period from around 2000 BC, to 1000 AD. The trouble started around 2000 BC, when just as the Anunnaki were fighting between themselves, over whether Enki's son Marduk, would get his wish to take control over the human settlements, from the other Anunnaki gods, something very strange was happening, to a man of Sumerian descent named Abram. He received directions from some god. Logic suggests that this god was God Yahweh, of Judaism, but there is no direct proof of this so far. The first appearance of Yahweh, on earth is at the time of Exodus and the creation of the State of Israel in 1433 BC. But regarding the creation of humankind, Yahweh had his version of history, that has been taught to people over the past three and a half thousand years, Enki, was the devil. Enki appears in the Bible as Nahash, the serpent, who seduced Adam and Eve. So who was Yahweh, he was a god in the same sense, in which the Anunnaki were gods, he was a ruler, a head of state, of the Pleiadians. He led the human slaves, out of Egypt and into the Palestinian land he had picked for his state of Israel. Like the Anunnaki, he was also a real physical force, 
not a myth in people's minds. Some thinkers have been puzzled by how could the Jews, so easily escape the Pharaoh's troops and defeat all the indigenous people of Canaan, who put up a defense against their invasion, even though the Jews were never particularly good warriors. Along the way to their promised land, they sacked the great city of Jericho. Jericho was the oldest city on earth, built around 8500 BC. Jericho was obviously built by the Anunnaki, not by humans. As the oldest city on earth and a major Anunnaki fortress, it was a repository of cultural valuables for thousands of years. The Jews laid it waste. But the question is how did they manage to do it? Jericho was a major Anunnaki outpost and certainly very well fortified. How could a mob armed with weapons no more advanced, than axes and spears and arrows overpower a fortified Anunnaki city? with guards armed with laser guns. The Jews themselves, of course, say that their god Yahweh helped them do it. And indeed he did. A close reading of the Bible reveals that as the Jews were marching from Egypt to their promised land, there was a UFO flying overhead. The accounts from the other side of the conflict confirm this. Yahweh was indeed responsible, and it was his ship that overpowered the defenses put up by the indigenous people of Canaan and their Anunnaki leaders. That is how the Judeo-Christian God, forced the Anunnaki and their slave human followers out of Palestine. Yahweh, wanted to take the control of the whole earth away from the Anunnaki. Over the millennium and a half before the birth of Christ, long and bitter wars were fought between Israel headed by Yahweh and the Anunnaki leaders. After centuries of bitter warfare the Pleiadians, were winning until a nuclear attack by the Anunnaki, mentioned before. The Middle East was lost to the Anunnaki. The Pleiadians had to evacuate to Western Europe. Where did the Anunnaki go? They settled in Eastern Europe. They became the gods of some ancient European people. Rome appears to be yet another culture under the aegis of the Anunnaki. The Roman gods were copied from the Greek ones, and the Greeks were Anunnaki. The head of the Roman pantheon is generally thought of as Jupiter, a parallel of the Greek Zeus, whom I have determined to be the same person as the Hittite Bal and the Semitic Shamash, the commander of space operations of the Anunnaki. The Anunnaki were forced out of the Middle East first, then out of Europe. Their last home on earth was ancient Russia, and when it was Christianized, the Anunnaki gods had to take off in their rockets and leave the earth. Many of them probably went back to their home planet, but others may be closer, no farther than the moon. Muslims recognize Allah as the moon god. And there is plenty of moon symbolism in Islam. The Anunnaki controlled the Middle East through Islam. After the Anunnaki left the Middle East, the people living there continued to worship them. Chief among them in certain lands was Allah. The timing only confirms this hypothesis, all this was happening at exactly the same time with Europe and Russia became Christian. Besides the general evidence for an active non-human base on the moon, it is widely rumored in certain circles that the US astronauts received very little welcome from the operators of this space. Simply put, the Yankees were told that they are not welcome on the moon and should go back to where they came from. The moon program was hastily abandoned as a result. I also suspect that the Soviets never went there not because they couldn't, but because they already knew. If the moon base is under a new Anarchy command as I suspect, their lack of hospitality to Uncle Sam's ambassadors is quite understandable. The present-day American imperialism hated by the rest of the world, is almost certainly of a Nunaki origin. When the European thinkers of the Renaissance rediscovered the ancient Egyptian teachings, they associated themselves first and foremost with, with the Egyptian goddess Isis. Sitchin has shown that Isis was the great-great-granddaughter of a Nunaki leader Inki. Inki led a separate faction of the Anunnaki that I believe was partially Syrian, as Inki's mother was apparently from Sirius, 
the brightest star as seen from Earth. It seems like several attempts were made at recovering the Earth long after it was taken over by the Pleiadians and all other Anunnaki fled in their spaceships. As it turns out there is a very well-known city on Earth that still bears her name. That city is Paris. Paris was founded around 300-200 BCE and its original Latin name is Par Isis, the city of Isis. In light of this knowledge and of the fact that France was a major center of the Enlightenment, coupled with some other curious facts, for example that Josephine, Napoleon's wife, considered herself almost a reincarnation of Isis, or that the French have copied many Egyptian elements and seriously contemplated building their own stone pyramids, a case can be made for the hypothesis that the Renaissance which significantly weakened the Catholic Church was none other than another attempt by the Anunnaki to take this planet back from the Pleiadians. It looks like that attempt was a partial success and partial failure. It wasn't entirely successful as the French Revolution was not carried all the way to a permanent regime change to bring back ancient Egypt under the Anunnaki. But it was a partial success in that feudalism gave way to capitalism. The internal contradictions of wild capitalism led to revolutionary situations forming in Russia and Germany, but the two countries took drastically different paths. As the hidden war between the Anunnaki and the Pleiadians took a new turn. I believe that the Cold War was actually that very same cosmic war, with the Soviets being on the side of the Anunnaki and the US being on the side of Pleiadians. Stalin's father was a Nyaz. Nyazi were the olden Russian nobility stemming from pre Tsarist ancient Russia. They probably allied with the Anunnaki to take Russia back. They now control Earth once more. In this video, I will explain the origins of the Israelites, and how I connect them with the Pleiadians. In my view, once the Pleiadians had established a forward operating base in Europe, they started putting pressure upon the Anunnaki. Much like the modern day North Korea situation. This incursion failed and the Pleiadians were taken prisoner. The Israelites were not Jewish when they were slaves in Egypt. They were Hebrews. Judaism came after Moses. Mesopotamian sources, refer to these Semitic groups as, Westerners. This became a Morite, a name more familiar today. Their presence destabilized, the Mesopotamian region. Leading to several Amorite leaders, taking power for themselves. Babylon, for example, was an irrelevant town until the Amorites, took control. Hammurabi, Babylon's famous leader, was himself a Morite. The Amorites were not the same as the Israelites. But both were northwestern Semitic groups, and the Amorites are the oldest such group we have records for. So the general consensus is that the later Israelites were, one way or another, descended from the Amorites. Or descended from the same area. Not all members of this group, were necessarily Semitic. And it's also not likely that, all members spoke the same language. Akkadian documents. From the late 16th century BCE, describe the Habiru migrating. Out of Mesopotamia and entering voluntary, temporary bondage. Some may have lived in their own villages, some definitely lived in the cities. 
they worked as laborers and mercenaries, but were never treated as natives or citizens, they were always outsiders to some degree, always living in separate buildings or even areas. In a 15th century BCE Egyptian list of groups in the trans chidin region, there are six groups of Shasu. One of them is the Shasu of YHWH. A label that matches the Hebrew, Yahweh. This now connects Western Europe, to the Israelites. Now I want to show you the connection, with the Hebrews and Plidians. October 11th. 1492. Christopher Columbus. And Pedro Gutierrez. While on the deck of the Santa Maria, 35 miles away from land, observed a light glimmering at a great distance. It vanishes and reappeared several times during the night. Columbus described the light as a wax candle that rose and lifted up. When Columbus arrived, the inhabitants eagerly came to him, and asked if they were, the people from the heavens. When he said no, they ignored him and told the others to come meet the people from the heavens. Weird coincidence, or were the Native Americans, connecting the lights in the sky from the previous days, with the arrival of Columbus and his men? The Ark of the Covenant, and Atonement cover, that was given to the Israelites, by the Pleiadians is technology even today we do not understand. God said to Moses, there, above the cover, between the two cherubim, that are over the ark of the testimony, I will meet with you, and give you all my commands for the Israelites. Tell your brother Aaron, not to come whenever he chooses, into the most holy place, behind the curtain, in front of the atonement cover on the ark, or else he will die because I appear, in the cloud, over the atonement cover. Above the ark, and the atonement cover, God appeared in his glory, in an unapproachable light. Because the ark, was God's throne among his people, it was a symbol of his presence and power, with them wherever it went. There are quite a number of miracles recorded in the Old Testament, surrounding the ark and saw with the presence of the ark. The waters of the river Jordan divided so the Israelites, could cross on dry land. And the walls of Jericho fell, so that the Israelites could capture it. Yet the ark could not be treated, with irreverence, because it was also, a symbol of God's judgment, and wrath. When the Israelites fought their enemies, the Philistines, during the time of the prophet Samuel, they disregarded the commands of the Lord, and took the ark out to the battlefield, with them summoning God's presence. God caused, the Philistines to win the battle, and the glory departed from Israel, for the ark of the Lord was taken. However, God showed his power to the Philistines, when he caused their idol, Dagon, to fall to the ground, when the ark was placed next to it, and several Philistine cities, were plagued heavily, when the ark was in their midst. Ultimately, the ark was returned to the Israelites. God, had provided this bread-like food, for the Israelites, when they grumbled, during the wanderings in the desert. It was bread from heaven, he continued to provide the food, daily and faithfully, but the people, were not one bit thankful. They complained, and wanted something else. The pot of manna, was an uncomfortable reminder, that despite, what God had provided for them, the Israelites had rejected God's provision. Although it is often referred to as the Seven Sisters, there are in fact thousands of stars in the Pleiades. Used 735 times, 54 times in the book of Revelation alone. The number seven is the foundation of God's word. There are seven days in a week and God's Sabbath is on the seventh day. The Bible, as a whole, was originally divided into seven major divisions. There are at least seven men in the Old Testament who are specifically mentioned as a man of God. They are Moses, 
David, Samuel, Shemaiah, Elijah, Elisha and Igdaliah. In the book of Revelation there are seven churches, seven angels to the seven churches, seven seals, seven trumpet plagues, seven thunders and the seven last plagues. The first resurrection of the dead takes place at the seventh trumpet, completing salvation for the church. There are seven annual holy days, beginning with Passover and ending with the last great day, the day after the Feast of Tabernacles ends. The cycle of the holy days is completed in three festival seasons by the seventh month of the sacred calendar, Jesus performed seven miracles on God's holy Sabbath day. We also find reference to the Pleiades, in Islam. Usually there is a connection with the devil. There are seven verses, in the first chapter in the Quran. During the rituals of Hajj, the pilgrimage to Mecca, pilgrims walk around the Kaaba, seven times. The Kaaba, is the most sacred site of Islam. Muslims believe it was rebuilt by Abraham, and his son Ishmael, pilgrims, are also required to throw seven pebbles, at each of the three walls representing the devil. The stoning of the devil is performed at Mina, just outside of Mecca. It is told that Muhammad one night flew on the winged steed, named Barak, from Mecca to Jerusalem. He was accompanied by the Archangel Gabriel. He landed on the Temple Mount. His journey continued from the temple rock through the seven heavens until he met Allah. He met earlier prophets in each of the heavens. There seven heavens in Islam. And also there seven gates of hell. Jahannam, is the Quranic word for hell. The unbelievers, the followers of the devil, and the jinns, will be driven to Jahannam, which is a place of fire, that keeps burning at all times. Jahannam has seven gates, which are open at all times. Hell also has seven layers, and sinners are sent to different layers, according to their sins. In the Hindu religion, again evidence can be found of the Pleiades. Hindu scriptures, declare that our earth is but one in a series of several planets. In all there are said to be fourteen planets or worlds out of which six are above earth, and seven are below the earth. According to Hindu scriptures, there are fifteen planets in all. Also in the well-known Jayatri mantra, seven worlds are mentioned. The Mandaka Upanishad, refers seven tongues and seven form of Agni. It is also believed that during our spiritual practice seven energies awake. The mother goddess, Dugra manifested herself into seven forms, during a fight with one of the demons called, Raktabia. The number seven is not only very sacred in Vedic, but even in the numerology world and other cultures. The earliest known depiction of the Pleiades is likely a Northern German Bronze Age artifact known as the Nebra Sky Disk, dated to approximately 1600 BC. Today, the Pleiades are officially considered part of the constellation of Taurus the Bull. 
Most people view the Pleiades as located on the shoulder of the bull, some on the neck and some others on the back. Jews and Arabians place the Pleiades as the rump of Aries, the ram, which is the constellation to the east of them. The Hindus place them on the head of the bull. The rest of the ancient world seems to view the Pleiades as a separate constellation. The Berbers living in the desert of North Africa call the Pleiades Kat Ahid. The name means in Berber, Daughters of the Night. Other Berber tribes call this star cluster Amana, meaning the guide. In Exodus 32.4, he took this from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made it into the molten calf and they said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. In the Celt religion, a prominent zoomorphic data type is the divine bull, Tarvos Tyrinius. Bull with three cranes is pictured on reliefs from the Cathedral of Trier, Germany and Notre Dame in Paris. In some Christian traditions, nativity scenes are carved or assembled at Christmas time. Many show a bull or an ox near the baby Jesus, lying in a manger. The worship of Yahweh as a bull. The worship of the sacred bull throughout the ancient world is most familiar to the western world in the biblical episode of the idol of the golden calf. The golden calf, after being made by the Hebrew people in the wilderness of Sinai, was rejected and destroyed by Moses in the book of Exodus. In Sumerian mythology, Marduk is the bull of Utu. In Hinduism, Shiva's steed is Nandi, the bull. The sacred bull survives in constellation Taurus. To the Anunnaki cultures, the bull was usually seen as being tamed or subdued or even sacrificed. In Mesopotamia, the Sumerian epic of Gilgamesh depicts the killing of the bull of heaven. In Crete, bulls were a central theme in Minoan civilization, with bull heads and bull horns used as symbols in Gnosis Palace. Minoan frescoes depict bull leaping in which participants of both sexes vaulted over the bulls by grasping their horns. In Cyprus, bull masks made from real skulls were worn in rites, bull mass terracotta figurines and Neolithic bull horned stone altars have been found in Cyprus. The Cainites and later Carthaginians, statues to which sacrifices were burnt, either as a dieter or type of sacrifice. Moloch was referred to as, as a horned man and likened to Cronus by the Romans. There may be a connection between the sacrifice to the Cretan horned man and the Minotaur. The association of child sacrifice with horned god as potentially on Crete and certainly in Carthage may also be connected to the Greek myth of sending young men and women to the Minotaur, a bull-headed man. In Arabic religions, the bull motif became a bull demon or the horned devil in contrast and conflict to earlier traditions. Zeus took over the earlier roles and in the form of the bull that came far from the sea, abducted high-born Europa and brought her to Crete. The religious practices of the Roman Empire of the 2nd and 4th centuries included a bull being sacrificed for the well-being of the people and the state. The cult reliefs of the Roman Mithraic mysteries depict Mithra's killing of a bull. The 
practice of bullfighting on the Iberian Peninsula and in southern France are connected. Various bull figures in the mythologies of ancient Sumer, Akkad, Assyria, Babylon, Egypt, Greece and Rome. Bulls also appear on the seal of the Indus Valley Civilization. When the Hebrews invaded Canaan, they lived for centuries alongside the native worshippers of the mighty bull god Baal. It was explicitly stated in the Book of Numbers that God, Elohim, had the horns of the wild ox, and his throne was guided by human-headed bulls called cherubim. In fact, bulls were set up as golden images of Yahweh in the two rival temples of the ten northern tribes of Israel. This was scandalous in the eyes of the southern Judean who made up no molten images of God. No greater zealot for Yahweh's integrity can be found in the Old Testament than the prophet Amos, and yet all the evidence shows that Amos tolerated the worship of his God in the form of a golden bull. The association the Australian Aborigines drew between the Pleiades and a bird is widespread. Many other peoples associate the Pleiades with birds. For example, Athenius, Hesiod, Binder, Simonides, and Sicily call them the seven doves. In the Bible, doves are associated with spirits. The ancients associate Taurus with the Noahic Flood, and Pleiades with the Ark, again tying the constellation to the Dove, and indirectly to the heavenly Jerusalem. In the Coverdale Bible of 1535, the margin note to the reference in Job reads, These seven stars, the clock and with her chicks, reflecting the then common name for the Pleiades among the North Central and Western Europeans, namely hen and chickens, a reference to Jerusalem. This is said to have come from Razel, and other Hebrew writers, who remarked on the similarity between the Greek word for Pleiades, and the Greek word for chicken coop. The Japanese also saw the Pleiades as a hen and her chicks. The Samoans know the Pleiades as the bird of paradise, the first hint of a link between the Pleiades and paradise. The Pleiades are associated with the Feast of the Dead on November 1st, as celebrated by the Roman Catholic Church in Europe, the Celtic Druids, and the natives of Peru. In Australia, the event sparked a three-day celebration in honor of the Pleiades. When we look at the lore associated, worldwide with the Pleiades, we find there are threads of all the elements connected with the Church in the Holy Bible. There can be little doubt that the original pattern, perhaps dating back to Adam who was the first astronomer among Jewish and early Christian writers, is at least in part preserved in the world's myths and tales of the Pleiades. We find then, in the Pleiades, a strong type of the Church of God. Revelation 1.20 says, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Today we call ourselves by the Greek word Christian, but have we ever questioned where the term originated? And what does it mean? The new Schaffer's Encyclopedia of Religious Knowledge confirms that the name, 
originated outside of Christian and Jewish circles. From my studies of theology, I have learned that the figure known as Jesus was created by the Council of Nicaea in the year 325 AD, as a way to bring together all of the Yeshua cults via Emperor Constantine. The Council added the supranational abilities of Mithra, Horus, and Osiris to the Jesus entity they created, and from that point forward, Christianity was created. The Bible has missing chapters such as the Book of Enoch, the Book of Jubilees, the Book of Numbers and the Book of the Wars of Jehovah, so one must question why any books would be illuminated and why. What we know through these missing books. For example, when the Israelites idolized the golden calf when Moses went to the mountains, it symbolized the age of Taurus. When Moses blew on the ram's horn, it symbolized the age of Aries. When Jesus fed the masses with two fish, it symbolized the age of Pisces. When Jesus said to follow the man bearing the pitcher of water, it symbolized the age of Aquarius. The King James Version of the Bible wasn't written until the year 1611, and was edited by Rosicrucian and Freemason, Sir Francis Bacon. With ties to secret societies, is it possible that the truth was twisted and or, encrypted? What we do know is that there is a Christian Bible on the main floor of any Freemason lodge. The story of Jesus was created by the Church as a means of subservience, control, and conformity to religion and government. While it's definitely possible that an entity with supernatural abilities existed, he was most likely an extraterrestrial or possibly an Anunnaki hybrid. The name Christian was a term employed to describe one who was an initiate, and understood the inner meaning of the Greek and Roman mystery religions. Thus, the early followers of Jesus refused to be called Christian. We find no less than 12 mythical historical personages before the advent of Christ, who are said to have suffered crucifixion, death and to have risen from the dead. Among them are, Krishna, Wutoba, Osiris, Attis, Indra, Prometheus, Mithra, Dionysius, Kesus, Escalabius, Adonis, Apollonius of Tyana. Several of these figures are said to have been crucified at the spring equinox, and to have risen on the third day. The date of Christmas was purposely fixed on December 25, to push into the background the great festival of the Sun God and Epiphany on January 6 to supplant an Egyptian festival of the same day. The Easter ceremonies rivaled the pagan spring festivals. The religious art of the Christians continued the pagan art of the preceding generations. The Christian representations of the Madonna and Child, are clearly the continuation of the representations of Isis and her son suckling her breast. The first Jewish menorah, was the one with seven branches that was lit by, priests, at the Holy Temple during Biblical times in Jerusalem. It is the symbol of the Jewish people and the State of Israel. The nine-branch menorah, called in Hebrew Chang Uka'iyah, is used only during the holiday of Hanukkah. The Talmud states that it is forbidden to use a seven-branched menorah outside of the temple, which is why the modern-day Chang Ukiah is slightly different. The tabernacle, according to the Hebrew Bible, was the portable dwelling place for the Divine Presence from the time of the Exodus from Egypt, through the conquering of the land of Canaan. The anointing oil for the tabernacle and the incense for the altar of incense made from God's own prescribed formulas of spices, were both declared holy by God, and could only be used for the purpose of the tabernacle, anyone else using the same formula for their own consumption would be cut off from Israel, Exodus 30. This oil used may have been a type of rocket fuel, 
Also the special garments for the priests were holy, if they did not wear the right clothing in serving the Lord, they could die, Exodus 28. Sounds like radiation suits are needed. God told Moses to create the tabernacle exactly the way he commanded. It was not to stray from God's blueprint. God had chosen the Israelites as his special people. For the Israelites to qualify for that distinction, God had demanded one thing. They must obey his law, the Ten Commandments. Robert Bigelow, founder of the military contractor Bigelow Aerospace. The Las Vegas tycoon spoke with 60 Minutes in May. Do you imagine that in our space travels we will encounter other forms of intelligent life? You don't have to go anywhere. You can find it here? Yeah. <laughs> Where exactly? It's just like right under people's noses. Oh my gosh. Wow. Robert Bigelow, founder of the military contractor Bigelow Aerospace. The Las Vegas tycoon spoke with 60 Minutes in May. Do you imagine that in our space travels we will encounter other forms of intelligent life? You don't have to go anywhere. You can find it here? Yeah. <laughs> Where exactly? It's just like right under people's noses. Oh my gosh. Wow. This is the cloud forest of the Amazon. It is a remote and inhospitable place. Yet last year, deep in the jungle, one of the most remarkable archaeological finds of the century was made. A sacred burial ground full of ancient mummies was discovered. Soon, rumors spread that these mummies were different to any ever found before in South America that they had discovered a lost race of people, until now assumed to be nothing but legend. The chroniclers always describe them as beautiful people, a tall, nice, uh, lighter complexion. The Spaniards reported that there were blue-eyed blonde people in Chachapoyas or in the Cloud people. The Incas found them to be the most beautiful women in the empire and they were uh, sought after by the Inca kings. Who were these people, laid to rest in high mountain tombs? And what were they doing there? For many of you, you already know that the Pleiadians are amongst us and have been for a long time. Actually, the peoples that we think of as European are all descendants of the 50,000 warrior colonists put on Earth about 4,000 years ago. This includes the peoples of Europe. Eastern Europe and Russia. It also includes about half the population of the US and Australia. Weren't there already people in Europe? No, the place was empty as the Anunnaki had driven the Neanderthal people to extinction, or deep into the earth by capturing their females to genetically manufacture high-quality slaves. So Europeans are all aliens, from other human planets. Europeans are of Pleiadian stock. The mummies were found in the northeast of Peru, on the far side of the Andes. Yeah. 
And there are also adult mummies here, wrapped in textiles. These mummies are hundreds of years old and should have rotted in the high humidity of the cloud forest. Yet they are wonderfully preserved. Something extraordinary is going on here, something the team don't fully understand. But as they explore the site further, clues begin to emerge. This is the best textile we've found so far in great state of preservation. This is a men's shirt and the technique for preparing this shirt is quite remarkable. The team's first thought was that they had found an Inca burial site. But figures of animals and demons are almost unknown in Inca art. And they didn't decorate the tombs of their dead with images like these. The pottery is very unusual as well. It seems to be a mixture between Chicha and Inca influences. Peter Lurcher is an anthropologist who's an expert on the cultures of this region. Comparing these pictographs with Inca design motives, it's definite that they are not belonging to the Inca culture. They are uh, expressions or artistic expressions of Tachapoin culture. What about the European Jews? They are what is left of the Anunnaki genetic engineering. They are not Pleiadians. The Neanderthals were the most advanced primates on Earth when the Anunnaki arrived about 50,000 years ago and were highly prized because they made excellent administrative slaves. The worker slaves were engineered by mixing Anunnaki genes with gorillas and chimpanzees and other primates. Orangutans were also highly prized and were the basis for slave populations in Asia. Wait a second, if the Europeans are Pleiadians, does that mean that all other peoples on Earth are what's left of the Anunnaki slave-making process? Yes, the Anunnaki were prolific in their slave-making, they took eggs from every primate on every continent and enhanced them with Anunnaki genes. The Anunnaki were the missing link that every anthropologist is looking for. But who were the Chachapoya, or the Cloud People? They are first mentioned in the Chronicles, books written by Spanish priests, but based on stories told by the Inca. The books speak of an Inca emperor who marched his army into the Cloud Forest in the 1480s and was astonished to find a great civilization there. These stories were dismissed as legends, but not by explorer Jean Savoy. The only thing I knew about the Chachapoyas is what I had read in the Spanish chronicles uh, regarding the conquest of the Chachapoyas kingdom by the Inca Tupac Yupanqui, who reported that he had conquered seven great cities. I didn't believe that uh, those cities that he had conquered had been found. So I decided to launch an expedition to Chachapoyas to find the Cloud people. It was 34 years ago that Jean Savoy first set off into the vast uncharted depths of the cloud forest. Finally, deep in the cloud forest, they came across ruins of great stone buildings hidden under centuries of jungle growth. I could actually at times hear 
the clashing of swords, the, uh, the battles that were going on between the Incas and the Spaniards, or the Chachapoyas and the Incas. Sometimes you would find uh, ceramic vessels just laying on top of the ground. It's as if they had fled these buildings and left them. It was very exciting to, to be in a virgin place that people hadn't been in for centuries. The locals had always known about the ruins. The natives were extremely superstitious about the ruins being enchanted. They talked about Salpe Machaco, which was a seven-headed snake that would wrap around you like a net. And they were actually terrified. They figured that they would be changed to stone. But what amazed me was the large number of round structures which could, we couldn't explain because the Incas built in rectangular linear lines. These buildings were shaped and decorated in a fashion never before seen in Peru. And Jean Savoy found something else that the Inca had talked about, cliff tombs. When the Inca Tupac Yupanqui invaded Chachapoyas, he stated what I find amazing was the tombs that they built up in the cliffs that uh, housed the chiefs and the overlords of the Chachapoyas kingdom. When he discovered cliff tombs exactly like those described by the Inca and like none other in South America, Savoy was convinced that he had indeed found the last resting place of the cloud people. But the Europeans can breed with everyone else. How is that possible? The Pleiadians evolved from the same kind of primates as were on Earth, but without interference from the Anunnakis. The Anunnakis evolved from lizard, reptilian lines. The big difference between the reptilian primate slave populations and the Pleiadian populations is the genetic encoding of social structures. The Anunnakis have a hive mentality similar to ants and bees, they have highly structured, top-down rules, laws that focus them on kings and queens as rulers. This is where the divine rule of kings came from. The ruler of the Anunnaki home planet, Nibiru, is a king. Anunnaki genes allow kings, dictators, but they also empower the idea of cities where masses of people huddle together. They also are a genetic baseline for mind control, primarily through propaganda and today's media. Reptilian primate peoples are hardwired genetically to embrace big government. Reptilian primate slave peoples are all left wing they cannot help themselves, it is hardwired into their genes. Pleiadian populations tend to be right wing and prize individual freedom, choice, truth, integrity, self-reliance and self-responsibility. But there are many who have chosen to be left-wing either before they were born or during this lifetime. As we all go through this gigantic change, our protectors, the Pleiadians, will make themselves known to us. We are not alone, we never have been. Anyone wonder why the Espionage Act in the USA is called the Draconian Espionage Act? Inside the tomb, a mummies with their hands bound over their eyes. There are also a large number of mummies wrapped in sackcloth, with faces stitched on the outside. Look at that embroidery. Oh, beautiful, look. Wow. Oh my God. Joey's saying a really big one is coming up. These mummies seem to be physically different as well. Yeah. Mummy bundles ranging from babies to <laughs> what seem to be really huge people. I mean, judging from the size of the mummy bundles, they must be about you know five ten, five eleven, which is really amazing. I've never been in a situation where I've been handed one mummy after another and just handed it to Sonia, who puts a label on it and then takes it off for storage in the cave and for bundling up for its journey to Lima Bombay. The fact that the mummies are tall is potentially very significant. 
Buried deep in the Spanish chronicles are fascinating passages describing the cloud people as beautiful and tall. They were a bit different to Andean people, and up till today, Chachapoyas, local people, look a bit different to, to other Andean people. That is reflected in the mummies. I think when the chroniclers said beautiful, it's because they were different and they were strong. Through the bones, they were taller, they were more robust, and if they had to live in this area, uh, certainly they had to be more robust. Near the lake where the mummies were found is the great fortress of Quelap, which is over a thousand years old. Almost certainly built by the cloud people, Quelap is the most monumental structure in the Americas. Its incredible walls are over 60 feet high and stretch for more than two thirds of a mile. The Great Pyramid of Egypt is a wonder of the world, yet this fortress was built from two and a half times as much granite all of which was carried to a mountain top over 9,000 feet above sea level. Over 500 years ago, the people of Peru knew the secrets of using herbs and chemicals to preserve the human body. Okay. Sonia Guillen and her colleagues are not prepared to speculate on who these mummies were or where they came from. They plan to do DNA analysis and skin testing, which may answer some of these questions. The last world war was not simply a war fought between the Allies and the Axis. It was part of an ancient battlefield of a galactic war. With the Anunnaki sponsoring the Nazis and the Pleiadians on the side of the American and British Empire, fought once again for control of planet Earth, while using its unsuspecting armies as pawns in their interstellar conflict. The conventional view of the outbreak of World War II is one in which Germany and Japan just happened to emerge as fascist military superpowers at the same time and decided to join forces and take over the entire world. In this view, it is coincidental that Japan would build an imperial fleet and become an invincible naval power and that Germany would simultaneously develop a fearsome blitzkrieg capable of using coordinated air and ground forces. Even at face value, this hypothesis seemed absurd to some. Such grand historical coincidences rarely occur and usually turn out of the result of malicious long-range planning and that seems to be the case with World War II. Now a growing group of researchers into the circumstances of Hitler's rise to power and a sudden coordinated emergence of militant fascism all over the world. See the roots of World War II in an extremely new and more disturbing light. Could it have been decided well in advance, at some very high level, that Japan would take over Asia and Australia, while Germany and Italy would divide up Europe, Russia and North and South America? The following scenario it is argued, is the once hidden true story of World War II. After World War I, at the end of 1919, ex-Corporal Adolf Hitler, met Dietrich Eckhart, in Munich. Eckhart was a sophisticated and wealthy publisher. He was also an occultist in the highest circle of the Thule Society, an esoteric group founded in Germany in 1918. 
He had been a student of Russian metaphysician Gurdjieff, who I suspect was a new Naki. Because of his admiration for Ricard, Hitler joined the society. The Thule Society held regular seances during which the attendees reportedly communicated with demons and attempted to invoke the Antichrist. During one such session, Eckhart believed that he was told by his spirit guide that he would have the honor of training the Corning Great One, the incarnation of the Antichrist. He soon became convinced that Adolf Hitler was the chosen one, and he took him under his wing. There can be no doubt that Eckhart trained Hitler in techniques of self-confidence, self-projection, persuasive oratory, body language and discursive sophistry. Using these capabilities Hitler became a powerful speaker, able to mesmerize and excite vast audiences. He learned to start his speeches softly, and then build to a peak of pretended frenzied fervor accompanied by animated gesticulations. He also developed a hypnotic power over individuals. Eckhart, it is reported, also passed on to Hitler all his occult knowledge of ritual and sexual black magic. According to Trevor Ravenscroft in The Spear of Destiny regarding the practices of the Thule Society, indulgence in the most sadistic rituals awakened penetrating vision into the workings of evil intelligences and bestowed phenomenal magical powers. At the completion of this training, Hitler claimed to be born anew filled with new strength and the resolve he would need to carry out his mandate. Eckhart died three years later in 1923, and reportedly said on his deathbed, follow Hitler. He will dance, but it is I who have called the tune. I have initiated him into the secret doctrine, opened his centers of vision and given him the means to communicate with the powers. Do not mourn for me. I shall have influenced history more than any German. The following year, Hitler dedicated the second volume of his book, Mein Kampf, to Eckhart. Eckhart's claim that he had given to Hitler the means to communicate with the powers has been interpreted to mean that Hitler could now solicit advice from those same entities that A. Lister Crowley referred to as the secret chiefs, since Eckhart was basically a disciple of Crowley who was also a new Naki. Crowley, who was sometimes referred to as the Great Beast, was the head of the infamous occult organization, Order of the Golden Dawn, in London. In late 1919, the Thule Society became more political, and was instrumental in starting the German Workers' Party under the leadership of Thulist Karl Hara. In 1920, this evolved into the National Socialist German Workers' Party, commonly known as the Nazi Party, drawing its membership from the top echelons of the Thule Society, including, Rudolf Hess, Heinrich Himmler, Alfred Rosenberg, Adolf Hitler, these great Aryan leaders, really, look at these people, none of them have blonde hair or blue eyes, these people were brainwashed by the Anunnaki and some I suspect were a new Naki hybrids. In The Gods of Eden, William Bramley says, Dot the Thule was a society of assassins. It held secret courts and condemned people to death. It is likely that many victims murdered by the district command had been condemned earlier in the secret courts of the Thule. The conception of the swastika flag adopted by the Nazis is attributed to Dr. Friedrich Krohn, a member of Thule. But Hitler's occult training was not yet complete. After the death of a cut, as if on a schedule, another even more powerful teacher came into his life. Karl Hauschofer was a 54-year-old professor of political science at Munich University when Hitler entered jail in 1924. While with German intelligence in Japan before the war, Hauschofer had been initiated into the ultra-secret Green Dragon Society, one of only three Europeans to have ever been granted that honor. There he was taught how to develop the mastery of the etheric body, or the time organism. 
This training apparently gave him precognitive powers and he was able to predict the dates and exact times of enemy attacks, the number of casualties, and bombardment patterns while a general during the war. We now know this as remote viewing. Consequently, Hauschofer emerged with an illustrious war record, and became well known throughout Germany. Hauschofer, like Eckhart, was convinced that he had found the savior of the German people that he had been seeking. Hauschofer subsequently visited Hitler frequently in his plush cell at the Landsberg fortress with books and papers under his arm, and helped him to write what became the Bible of the Nazi movement, Mein Kampf, virtually dictating long passages. Hauschofer's domination of the entire philosophical basis of the Nazi movement was solidified when he founded the Luminous Lodge of Real Society in Berlin in 1920. This eventually became the inner circle of the Thule Society, and reportedly attracted members from other occult movements in Europe, as well as from Tibet, Japan, India, Kashmir, Turkey and Ceylon. Its most inspirational book was The Coming Race by Edward bulwer -Lytton, a story about an underground utopian civilization where the inhabitants flew around in silent wingless vehicles, powered by a force called Vril, hence the name of the society. Hauschofer knew a great deal about life on Atlantis, almost as though through personal memory, he taught Hitler that the Aryan race was genetically developed by the gods of Atlantis in preparation for the coming disaster, to be a new master race afterwards. He claimed that the Aryans were given higher consciousness and the faculty of logical thought, instead of just super-memory as with the preceding sub-races on Atlantis. He convinced Hitler that the pure Germans were descended from this civilization from Ultima Thule, sometimes called Hyperbora, and were meant to be the nucleus of the new master race. Hauschofer believed that this race of Aryan supermen survived the Atlantean upheavals and still existed somewhere underground in Tibet or the Gobi Desert, and he convinced Hitler to try and make contact with them. From 1926 through 1942, Hauschofer organized annual German expeditions to Tibet. He apparently succeeded in making contact with an underground civilization in Tibet known in occult literature as Agatha, sometime in the early 1930. It is known that Hauschofer met some monks from this underground city, and enlisted them in the Nazi cause. Some literature on this subject describes the monks as adepts of the dark side. They came to Berlin and set up a community. They were later joined by members of the Japanese Green Dragon Society, at the invitation of Hauschofer. In the secret meetings of the Vril Society, attended by Hauschofer, Hitler, and the key members of the Thule Society, a very talented medium by the name of Maria Orsic began to get psychic transmissions in an unknown language, which they were eventually able to decipher. As they continued, it was determined that the messages were coming from two planets in the Aldebaran system comprising the Sumeran Empire. Aldebaran is a huge star in the Taurus constellation thousands of time larger than our own Sun, about 65 light years from Earth. The information channeled by Orsic claimed that the Sumeran Empire consisted of an Aryan or master race, and a subservient slave race, and that the Aryans colonized our solar system 500 million years ago when the Aldebaran system became uninhabitable. When they eventually reached Earth, they founded the Sumerian civilization. According to Peter Moon in The Black Sun, as they continued to study the transmissions, the Vril Society discovered that the ancient Sumerian language was identical to that of the Aldebarans and that it was also similar to the German language. Whether or not they materialized in the flesh in the inner sanctum of the Vril Society, or met with the Nazi leaders in the underground city through the mediation of the Tibetan monks, there is no doubt that Hauschofer and Hitler 
at least, met with the Ubermanshaw Superman. In a conversation with Hermann Rauskning, the governor of Danzig, about the possibility of creating a new, advanced species of human through breeding, Hitler said, as reported by Rauskning, the new man is living amongst us now. He is here, exclaimed Hitler, triumphantly. Isn't that enough for you? I will tell you a secret. I have seen the new man. He is intrepid and cruel. I was afraid of him. Samuel Mathers, the founder of the Golden Dawn, had a similar encounter. In a manifesto to the members in 1896, he wrote, as to the secret chiefs with whom I am in touch and from whom I have received the wisdom of the Second Order. They used to meet me physically at a time and place fixed in advance. For my part, I believe they are human beings living on this earth, but possessed of terrible and superhuman powers. I felt I was in contact with a force so terrible that I can only compare it to the shock one would receive from being near a flash of lightning during a great thunderstorm. Wonder weapons could the secret chiefs or supermen have been extraterrestrials, perhaps currently living on Earth or elsewhere? In light of subsequent developments, such a conclusion seems not unreasonable. Possibly, because of this contact with Hitler, the Nazis were to acquire scientific knowledge and weapon technologies far beyond anything previously seen on Earth. The weapons became known as the Wonder Were for Wonder Weapons. This all seems especially remarkable when it is understood just how much the Nazi inner circle detested science and book knowledge and embraced psychic information and ceremonial magic instead. According to Peter Moon, as early as 1919, the combined Thule and Vril societies began work on a time machine which was completed in 1924 and taken to a hiding place in southern Germany. This early development, it is said, resurfaced after the war and was continued 30 years later as the Montauk Project, in an underground base at Montauk Point, Long Island where ex-Nazi scientists were assisted by extraterrestrials and it was the Vril Society that reportedly developed the first anti-gravity craft, the RFZ-1, as early as 1934. The Society raised its own funds for this development by soliciting donations in German newspapers. This first model crashed and burned, but the RFZ-2, 60 feet in length, flew quite well and was used as a reconnaissance craft and so it came to the attention of SS Chief Himmler. By this time, Hitler was in power and he turned the anti-gravity development project over to the SS, to develop directly with the Vril Society. He himself was more interested in conventional weaponry. By 1939, the SS had developed the RFZ-5, which was renamed to become the famous Hanabuai, a two-man craft about 35 feet in diameter powered by a Tachin type electrogravitation motor called the Kola Converter. Purported plans for Hanabu either motor, it was claimed, converted the Earth's gravitational energy into electromagnetic power. The Nazis continually improved on the Hanabu model, culminating in the Hanabu 3 later in the war. A huge craft, 200 feet in diameter, the Hanabu 3, it was said, could reach a speed of 24,000 miles per hour at an altitude of 15,000 feet and could carry 32 passengers. But strangely, the Germans were never able to adapt these incredible flying machines to conventional warfare. It is suggested that they couldn't train the pilots, and that the craft were not maneuverable enough to engage fighter planes in dogfights, and that they couldn't be used as bombers although they could easily reach the U.S. without refueling. The Nazis chose to focus instead on von Braun's robotic rocketry, believing that they could so frighten the civilian population of London with their V-2 flying bombs that they could precipitate a mass movement to surrender. As history makes dear, 
they severely underestimated the legendary British stiff upper lip. The Nazis also pioneered jet-powered propulsion. The first jet fighter plane in the world, the fearsome Messerschmitt Me 262, could easily have turned the tide of the war if it had lasted several months longer. German scientists were also working on development of nuclear weapons long before America got into the act. Nuclear fission was discovered in 1938 by Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute in Berlin. The Germans were producing heavy water in Vimorg, Norway in 1943 in preparation for using it to refine plutonium. But Hitler and Albert Speer scuttled the program after chief civilian nuclear scientist Werner Heisenberg failed to sell the project as a feasible way to win the war. Allied soldiers discovered a uranium-based nuclear reactor underground in Hagelosch, Germany, Heisenberg's hometown, and several thousand pounds of uranium buried nearby. The consensus is that Germany would have developed the bomb before the US. If it hadn't been for Hitler's poor judgment in scientific matters, and the sabotage and heavy allied bombardments of technological sites, although some think that Heisenberg, a former protégé of Nobel Prize winning Danish physics Niels Bohr, deliberately diverted his research away from weaponry. Strange as it might sound, the case could be made that German advanced scientific knowledge and weaponry was supplied by extraterrestrials somehow connected with a purported underground civilization in Tibet. Exactly how this information was conveyed is not clear, but some argue that the connection was established through the mediation of Karl Hauschofer, and that a group of monks from that underground Tibetan city came to live in Berlin to assist with Hitler's war plans. They were, reportedly, known as the Society of Green Men. There is some evidence to suggest that this situation evolved to the point that aliens were actually working shoulder to shoulder with German scientists. Hitler envisioned a new world order to last a thousand years. With the help of architect Albert Speer he designed grandiose buildings and the monuments to accommodate his new one world Aryan civilization, to be supported by the slave labor of the inferior races. However, it now seems that this reputed alliance with extraterrestrials was a marriage of convenience, since apparently they had a similar goal and, indeed, may have been using Hitler as some kind of straw man to facilitate their intended takeover of the planet. If all that is true, it puts the European war in a totally new light, just one piece in an elaborate worldwide campaign of alien design, which included the participation of Japan in order to control the seas. From this perspective, the outbreak of World War II can be viewed as a push by the extraterrestrials to impose a fascist dictatorship of the entire planet, under their control. If that is the case it appears that the planning may have begun in the early years of the 20th century, and that Hitler's rise to power was coordinated with Mussolini's in Italy and the emergence of Hideki Tojo in Japan. Such a scenario would help to explain many strange similarities between the three fascist movements, especially the militarization of the governments, and the imposition of elaborate and sophisticated propaganda machines. Propaganda, after all, is nothing more than a form of national mind control, and we suspect that the aliens are very skilled in these techniques. At the close of World War I in 1919, under the terms of the Versailles Treaty, Germany was allowed to keep only 100,000 men in the army and 15,000 in the navy. They were not permitted to have submarines or military aircraft. This situation remained basically stable for the next 14 years until Hitler came to power in 1933 and then, in March of 1935, instituted conscription and renewed military training in open violation of the treaty. To achieve the extravagantly ambitious goal of world conquest, 
Germany would need a bright new army of young, ruthless, efficient, well-trained stormtroopers numbering in the millions. In 1933 that seemed like an impossible dream, since the army then consisted mainly of 100,000 aging, dispirited veterans of WWI, and some raw recruits. It seemed especially hopeless in view of the depressed economic conditions in Germany at that time. Yet, in September of the very next year, six months before conscription began, at the Nuremberg Nazi rally of 1934, 160,000 stalwart German soldiers with backpacks and rifles stood silently at attention in precise ranks as Hitler. Heinrich Himmler and Saar Chief Victor Lutz walked down the wide center aisle towards flaming columns bordering a gigantic wreath honoring German soldiers killed in battle. This fantastic scene was captured in the now famous documentary, Triumph of the Will by legendary film photographer Leni Riefenstahl. Where did those 160,000 perfect young soldiers come from? In October of 1935, Hitler supplied the answer to that riddle when he made public that he had kept 21 infantry divisions under wraps in 1934, and he announced that they would now become the core of the new German army, the Wehrmacht. So that's where the 160,000 came from, but where did the 21 divisions come from? An infantry division can be as many as 20,000 troops, so it seems that somehow Miller magically got his hands on an instant army of about 500,000 soldiers, with no explanation of where they came from or how they had been trained. He announced also that an additional 21 divisions would soon be added. One may be forgiven for wondering just how was it possible for all this to be accomplished only one year after Hitler became Chancellor of Germany? Now that we have evidence of alien involvement in the war preparations, a startling explanation presents itself. It is now believed by many that the aliens have mastered cloning biotechnology and in fact that the small grey ETs of abduction fame are clones themselves. Could it be possible that Hitler's alien friends presented him with a ready-made million-man army of clone stormtroopers? We have already seen that the planning for World War II probably began in the early part of the century. Was Hitler's army secretly growing up in spaceships or underground cities even as real soldiers were dying by the millions on the battlefields of Europe? Perhaps George Lucas knew more than is commonly believed when, in 2001, he wrote episode 2 of a Star Wars saga titled Attack of the Clones. When it comes to fantastic possibilities for the Nazi, E.T. connection, though, that is only the beginning. A Nazi moon base according Lo Vladimir Terzisky. The Germans succeeded in reaching the moon sometime in 1942, and established a base on the dark side. Terzisky is a controversial figure in the UFO community, but he has impressive credentials. Lai is a Bulgarian-born engineer and physicist and reportedly is conversant in English, Japanese, Russian and German in addition to his native Bulgarian, and is therefore uniquely able to do research in all these languages. He says, the Germans landed on the moon probably as early as 1942, utilizing their larger exo-atmospheric rocket sources of the Mayeth and Shriva type. The Shriva Walter turbine powered craft was designed as an interplanetary exploration vehicle. It had a diameter of 60 meters, had 10 stories of crew compartments, and stood 45 meters high. Terzisky claims that after establishing the initial surface base they tunneled underground, and by the end of the war there was a small Nazi research base on the moon. The free energy touch and drive craft of the Hall Nibu 1 and 2 type were used after 1944 to haul people, 
materials, sick, and the first robots to the construction site. He claims that the moon has an atmosphere, water and vegetation, and it is possible to get around without space suits, despite NASA propaganda to the contrary. If Terzisky is right, it seems reasonable to suspect that the aliens played a large role in the Nazi moon adventure. While obviously this fantastic accomplishment would have had little wartime strategic value, it should be remembered that, in 1942, the Germans were supremely confident of winning the war, and were projecting their space travel, conquest, plans well ahead into the thousand-year Third Reich. Complex scenarios arguing for consideration of alien involvement in the politics and wars of Earth. Among those offering supposedly detailed information concerning the extraterrestrial intervention factor typical is someone called Branton. All we know about him is that he claims to have been abducted many times since the age of 12, and that his information accords with David Icke and some other such sources. The following is taken from Branton's material. A formal treaty was executed in 1933 between the Nazi Bavarian Intelligence Agency, which eventually became the S.S, and the Greys, an alien race living in underground bases in Tibet and elsewhere in the world, facilitated by the Thule Society. The Greys are said to be from Zeta II Reticuli. The Greys, in turn, it is said, are subservient to the reptilians, and are believed to be implanted with biochips to keep them under control. They are mostly a cloned race, having lost the ability to reproduce eons ago, due to radioactive fallout from nuclear wars on their home planet. There is a group of about 2,000 original Grey prototypes from which the clones are copied. Many abductees have commented on their robotic, totally unemotional behavior. The reptilians are a fierce, tyrannical race from Alpha Draconis, sometimes referred to as reptiloids because they are human-like in basic form, but their skin, it is claimed, is scaly, and their faces are lizard-like with vertical slit eyeballs. They are up to 8 feet tall, and very strong. They are considered by some extraterrestrials to be master geneticists, but others claim that they have botched many of their genetic experiments. Their most powerful capability is mind control, and in this they are considered undisputed experts. This accounts for their ability to shape shift, or to take on a human appearance, because they can plant that illusion in the mind of the observer. They are in league with other reptilian races from Rigel Orion and Bellatrix Orion. Together they are referred to as the Draco Orion imperialists, and have taken over many of the star systems in the 21 star cluster in this section of the galaxy, comprising the Draco Orion slash Grey Empire. The Draco Orionites are referred to as interventionists because they boldly seek to enslave other races. Like the fascists that they sponsored, they are cruel and merciless. Their ancient enemies are the humanoid races from Andromeda, Arcturus, Lyra, the Pleiades and Sirius. The main Pleiadian faction is from the planet Hera circling the star Tegeta, one of the Seven Sisters. Taken together, this group of civilizations comprises the Galactic Federation. The Dull Universe is also part of the Federation. The Federation races are non-interventionist in that they believe deeply in freedom, and will never try to influence or persuade other developing races, or to block or violate their right to make free will choices, and, in fact, they seek to assist in spiritual development. The Federation forces on Earth are based under Death Valley in Mount Shasta in California. The Star Wars began when the Draconians attacked Lyra and the Pleiades. Branton says, the stories that contactees tell of the devastating battles and galactic massacres, 
in almost every case initiated by the collectivist interventionist reptiloids, greys, between the two galactic superpowers are integral although controversial elements. While the Draco greys, it is claimed, gave the Germans fantastic weapons including jet propulsion, rocketry, television-guided missiles, anti-gravity aircraft, nuclear technology, and possibly even a cloned army, that the Allies were not completely without alien assistance. The ETs, it is said, gave the Allies one man, Nikola Tesla. It was Tesla, according to this line of argument, who first saw the promise of radar in 1917, and was instrumental in its development and use in the war. Consequently, the British and the US had sophisticated radar defenses deployed early in the war using Tesla's patents, while the Germans gave it scant attention, and it was radar that won the Battle of Britain. Tesla and Roosevelt met in 1917 when FDR was Secretary of the Navy, and Roosevelt was very impressed with Tesla's genius. In 1936, according to some reports, he put Tesla in charge of the Invisibility Project, working with the Navy. In 1940, as the story goes, they succeeded in making a ship disappear in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Whether or not invisibility was secretly used in the war is unknown. Tesla also invented, it is claimed, particle beam weaponry which he publicly referred to as the Death Ray. It was not, it seems developed soon enough to use in the war, but satellite-based versions have since, it is believed, become potent weapons in both US and Soviet arsenals. Tesla is also said to have been offered a large amount of money to go and work for Germany but that he refused, and that he remained an American patriot to the end. Tesla often made mention of his off-planet friends, say some, Sometime in the mid-thirties, they say, he arranged a meeting between Roosevelt and Pleiadian representatives, which supposedly took place on a ship in the Atlantic. Within the alien tracking internet community it is believed that some sort of agreement came out of that meeting, and that a Federation representative may have consulted at the Pentagon for most of the war. Sometime in late 1944, the story goes, when it became apparent that they had lost the war, the Germans moved the main components of their anti-gravity aircraft technology and their top scientists to their subterranean base in the Antarctic called Neuschkabenland, which they had been preparing since 1938. It is suspected that an extraterrestrial base had already existed there, and that it was inhabited by their compatriots, the Drake or Ionites. The Germans had been assiduously patrolling and defending the sea lanes to Antarctica since early in the war as they moved men and materials there in U-boats. They stationed their largest battle cruiser, the Graf Spee, off the coast of Argentina sometime in 1939, and they were known to be sinking even merchant vessels sailing in those waters. If true, this might explain why the Allied armies found only superficial remnants of flying disc development as they overran Germany, and none of the important scientists could Antarctica have been the destination of the so-called Lost Battalion of 250,000 German troops that could never be accounted for? Could these have been perhaps carefully kept and maintained cloned stormtroopers? to be used as genetic prototypes for the new way act. By April of 1945, the European war was winding down as the Allied troops converged on Berlin. At that point, it is claimed, all the anti-gravity technology and scientists had been transferred to Neuschwedenland. It was from that Antarctic base that the Germans decided to launch a mission to Mars, jointly with the Japanese. Vladimir Terzisky says, according to the authors of the underground German documentary movie from the Thule Society, the only produced craft of the Horniba 3 type. 
the 74-meter diameter naval warfare dreadnought, was chosen for the most courageous mission of this whole century, the trip to Mars. The trip reportedly took almost eight months because the large Andromeda-type tach and drives were turned off immediately after the escape from the Earth's gravitation, and the ship coasted the rest of the way in an elliptical orbit. Terzisky believes that the crew probably numbered in the hundreds. The huge craft crash landed on Mars in January. 1946 severely damaging the Tachin drives and making return impossible, but according to the documentary, the crew knew from the beginning that it was probably a suicide mission. Terzisky says, the radio message with the mixed news was received by the German underground space control center in Neschwedenland and by their research base on the moon. Evidently, with the war on Earth lost. The Axis partners decided to position themselves off-planet in readiness for the next round, and the advent of the Fourth Reich. All the chroniclers of World War II agree that the German soldiers were very tough and courageous, and almost robotic in terms of efficiency. They obeyed orders without question, even in the face of certain death. As the Blitzkrieg rolled over Europe, they could do no wrong. It was their insensitivity to human suffering that made the atrocities in Russia, and the concentration camps. The Einsatzgruppen were taken from the ranks of the Wehrmacht, possible. Maybe, though, it wasn't that they were sadistic, maybe they just didn't care. But, on the other hand, they showed no resourcefulness. Whereas the British and American soldiers could be relied on to come up with ideas even in the worst situations. Ultimately, the thinking soldier with a heart prevailed. Apparently, the moral of the story is, if you expect to win a war with an army of clones, you better have someone with great intelligence directing them, and Hitler just didn't fill the bill. When it came to intellect, he was no match for the combined brain power of Franklin Roosevelt, Winston Churchill, and an allied army of citizen soldiers from free societies. We shall never surrender. And no official of my administration, whether his rank is high or low, civilian or military, should interpret my words here tonight as an excuse to censor the news, to stifle dissent, to cover up our mistakes, or to withhold from the press and the public the facts they deserve to know. But I do ask, but I do ask every publisher, every editor, and every newsman in the nation to re-examine his own standards and to recognize the nature of our country's peril. In time of war, the government and the press have customarily joined in an effort based largely on self-discipline to prevent unauthorized disclosures to the enemy. In times of clear and present danger, the courts have held that even the privileged rights of the First Amendment must yield to the public's need for national security. Today, no war has been declared and however fierce the struggle may be, it may never be declared in the traditional fashion. Our way of life is under attack. Those who make themselves our enemy are advancing around the globe. The survival of our friends is in danger. And yet no war has been declared. No borders have been crossed by marching troops. No missiles have been fired. If the press is awaiting a declaration of war, before it imposes the self-discipline of combat conditions, then I can only say that no war ever posed a greater threat to our security. If you are awaiting a finding of clear and present danger, then I can only say that the danger has never been more clear and its presence has never been more imminent. It requires a change in outlook, a change in tactics, a change in missions by the government, by the people, by every businessman or labor leader, and by every newspaper. For we are opposed around the world 
by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. It conducts the Cold War in short with a wartime discipline no democracy would ever hope or wish to match. Nevertheless, every democracy recognizes the necessary restraints of national security. And the question remains whether those restraints need to be more strictly observed if we are to oppose this kind of attack as well as outright invasion.